To live deep in the jungle requires a special knowledge of your surroundings, the art and craft of living using the world around us that I call bushcraft. It's a way of life that's still very much alive with the Equana of Venezuela, who I spent the last week with. But bushcraft also gives us the skills to travel through unsport places like this and to sense the jungle in all its vastness. Today I'm going to follow a traditional trading route that links the Iquana people deep in the rainforest with another group of people called the Pamon who live on the edge of the rainforest where it turns to savannah. I'm in the Amazon jungle in Venezuela, near the Brazilian border. My route takes me to the edge of the jungle, to a land fit for dinosaurs, past some of the most spectacular scenery on Earth. Today's programme celebrates journeys through this incredible environment, from the earliest explorers drawn by the natural history of the jungle to lovers separated by the greatest river on earth. My journey is a personal journey. Trekking through the jungle is a fabulous experience. It reduces life to its important elements. But when you walk out towards the edge of the jungle, in many ways, you're traveling through time. A snapshot, if you like, of all the forces working on bushcraft. In some ways my journey started last week. I just spent 10 days deep in the forest at the start of this trading route with some very special people from the Aquana village of Kanarakuni. The place they live in is so remote that they rely on bushcraft, their knowledge of the natural world and how to use it to provide everything they need to live, food, shelter, medicine. For centuries they relied on trading paths to obtain the few things their surroundings couldn't provide. Like so many indigenous groups around the world, I found their way of life so appealing. It's something that starts when they are born and stays with them all their life, so I was just as struck by the skill of the children on the water as I was by the incredible depth of knowledge of Luis, one of the village elders. At every turn, either he, Saul or Benito would want to stop and show me some plant or leaf they have a use for. It was wonderful to be able to spend time with them, as it meant I could appreciate not just their skills and knowledge, but I could learn a little about them as people. Despite the huge language barrier, we developed a great understanding, and they've given me memories that I will cherish for the rest of my life. Of course, I'm not the first person to spend time with the Aquana. Charles Brewer Carias is Venezuela's most famous explorer. He lives in the hills overlooking Caracas, but he's explored more of this country than anyone else. His list of exploits is endless, and he's even had plants and animal species named after him. Like most people who spend any length of time in wilderness areas, Charles learnt the value of bushcraft from his first forays into the jungle 40 years ago when he first spent time with the Equana. I was in the hands of these extraordinary Indians, the Makiritari or Yequana Indians. And with them I, I learned everything about the jungle and to read, I would say, the jungle and to understand that the jungle is like a huge supermarket. But a supermarket with Chinese signs, and if you don't read the Chinese in the super, Chinese supermarket, you are lost. But these people taught me how to identify every tree, everything, and then I could live uh, like being in my place. Actually, in my first experience with the Equana, it was not a very good experience the first days, 
after I could talk something, one of my friends, he got very serious and he was mad with me, I don't know why, and say, do you know how to make canned beans and canned sardines? I said, well, you make can, you put the sardines there, you cook them, and you wait till they're very hot and then you seal them, so there's no way they will corrupt. Well, let's do, the, let's do one. Let's make a can. Oh, I, I, I don't know. And to make an aluminum pan, yes, we have here oxide. And it could be done if we have the, enough electrical power. So we couldn't do it. No. Do you know how to weave a basket or your hammock? No. If you don't know how to take care of your food, if you, don't know how, if you do not know how to make your things to cook, if you don't know how to make your bed, how it is that you are alive, you do not deserve to be alive. You are like a little boy among us. That's it. And this is the way I was in the, in the society, the lowest rank. But I start to learn everything to be considered a soto, a person. And I learned the language. I even learned to make the flutes and to play the flutes of the, with their music. The most rewarding thing is one of the Indians, the same one, and he say, you know, Charles, you are like, you are almost a man now. You are almost a soto. I would consider you my, my, my brother. That was an incredible situation. I could well understand how Charles felt. Bushcraft can bring many such experiences, and the more you put in, the more you get out. But it's a world that's changing, and the first sign of the times is that this route is no longer in use. The weeks of walking have given way to boats and even planes. I only had time to follow a part of the route, but there's little to match the feeling of traveling through jungle. One of the fundamental rules of a jungle journey is to stop well before dark to give yourself time to get sorted. Well, it's time to set up camp again. It's a familiar routine. Quite enjoy it really. Found a couple of trees the right distance apart and I'm clearing away the undergrowth so that there's nothing that can crawl up into my, my little world within my mosquito net. I always like to clear the leaves a little bit in case there are any scorpions or any other biting things hiding there. I'm quite lucky on this occasion because here there's a lot of dead wood which has been good firewood so that's helpful. Normally you have to go off searching for it but on this occasion it's here already waiting for me. Perfect. You need to know just three knots to set up your camp. All of them quick release knots. A Siberian hitch is used for one end of your roof. The knot at the other end provides tension. The last thing I need is the roof bowing when it rains and acting as a huge basin to tip water onto me. The adjustable knots on the edge make everything flat and taut. hammock is tied up using a Siberian knot but for extra security because I'm obviously going to be putting my weight on, the, on this to make sure it doesn't slip I pull an extra loop through this loop here just to lock it in place that makes it secure. That's it tied. I tied it at a convenient height here and now I slide it up the tree higher than my tarp Guy line. Of 
course I've been tying these knots for so long that they're second nature to me. But there's a first time for everyone and I watched as the crew started to get the hang of things. One of the great things about any journey is that it gives everyone a chance to learn. There are lots of different ways of going about feeding yourself when you're on an expedition. Normally, we would have a, a central kitchen, bring in some food from outside and cook commonly. But on this occasion, we've got the rare luxury of having individual ration packs. I really like this way of living outdoors because there's a lot of autonomy and there's a lot of versatility. You can go anywhere, you can, you've got a, a pack lunch already prepared. And um, it also brings the fun of sharing the bits you don't like with the bits that other people have got that they do like. It's just one of the things you need to consider when you're planning any sort of trip. It's common sense, really. But there are lots of ways of doing things wrongly. One of the most ludicrous I ever came across is recorded in the book White Waters and Black. It was written by an explorer called Gordon McRae, who some have speculated was the inspiration for Indiana Jones. The book tells the story of an American expedition in 1923 that was supposed to be one of the most expensive and best equipped ever mounted to explore the Amazon. McCray wasn't in charge of this expedition, however, and the record of it is a litany of one mistake after another. To spare their blushes, each member of the group is referred to solely by title. The director, the geologist, the botanist, and so on, because none of them acquitted themselves well perhaps not surprising. Of the six scientists, five had never even seen a jungle, nor apparently had ever travelled anywhere other than by train. You have to question the selection process with credentials like that. Equipment lists may have changed over the decades, but even by the standards of the 1920s, this one was excessive. Four tonnes of equipment, much of it in heavy cases. At one stage, the mule train stretched four miles. And to cap it all, none of the boxes were labelled. When they did finally get through searching them all, they discovered that the expedition director had neglected to bring such essentials as cooking utensils and lanterns. As they journeyed deeper into the jungle, the speed with which the team fell apart was matched only by the scarcity of scientific findings of any worth. Perhaps not surprisingly, the expedition was riven with infighting. The director even quit, but McRae obviously loved exploring as he stuck it out. Maybe he was having too much fun, mostly at the expense of the botanist. He was so busy inventing animal sightings for a book he hoped would make his name and fortune that he didn't realise McRae and the entomologist were feeding him sightings of animals that lived anywhere but the jungle. At the time, it was described as the highly unofficial account of an Amazonian expedition which could have been staffed by the Marx Brothers. I can't help but agree. Over-equipped expeditions like that are almost doomed to failure. In wilderness areas, it's better to be equipped with bushcraft because knowledge doesn't weigh anything. The way I pack my camp away is actually more important than the way I pitch it because I want everything to be in the order that I want to find it so that if at the end of the day when I come to set up again I'm tired or it's dark or it's raining I don't want any tangles. I want to be able to put my camp up straight away. It's important to get into a clear straightforward routine when you're living in remote areas. You never know what the day will hold. I always stuff my hammock into a dry bag. That way, even if the sky is open, I know I'll have a dry place to sleep at the end of the day. This is where you really get the benefit of all those quick release knots. Especially if it's wet, when a well-practiced routine gives all the speed you need.
Hanking the rope like this makes sure that you don't end up with a bird's nest of tangled lines when you come to put your camp up. It's this sort of attention to detail that makes all the difference in bushcraft. I always slide my tarp up to one end and fold it in the same manner every morning. Remember, the aim is to pack all this as small as humanly possible. After all, everything has to fit into the rucksack on your back. It's hard to describe the sense of satisfaction this sort of routine brings, but there is a great stillness to be gained from taking responsibility for your own comfort and well-being day after day. Leaving one end of the roof line tied to the tree is just one of my little tricks that makes it easier to roll up the tarp and safer as you're not kneeling on the ground. Of course the tarp goes in right at the top of my rucksack. It's the first thing I'll need when I come to set up camp. After you've been in the rainforest for a couple of weeks, the routine of life takes over and you start to notice the details of the world around you. You really start to fit in. But I have heard tell of tourists who come here, they don't even take their boots off for up to two weeks because they're so afraid of the forest. That's sad. Because it's the natural world of the jungle that's acted as a magnet to many of us over the centuries. In the Victorian age, there was a flood of scientists as travel to such far-flung destinations became a possibility. And being Victorian, many of them left great works for posterity, like The Naturalist on the River Amazon by Henry Bates. Bates is perhaps best known for his theory on mimicry. Observing butterflies, he noticed that harmless species would mimic the colour of poisonous ones to avoid being eaten by predators. But I like his book because he is so obviously smitten with the jungle. Even today, his prose leaps out with admiration for this place. In these tropical forests, each plant and tree seems to be striving to outvie its fellow, struggling upwards towards light and air, branch and leaf and stem regardless of its neighbour. Charles Darwin described it as the best book of natural history travels ever written, and you don't get much higher praise than that. Bates describes jungles as being places of permanent summer, where growth has gone mad, and it's the survival of the fittest but he found beauty in this dog-eat-dog -dog world. It's especially the enjoyment of life manifested by individual existences which compensates for the destruction and pain caused by the inevitable competition. And he's right, there is something destructive and beautiful in the way jungles grow. I've been to this area before. About 10 years ago, I visited the Sanama people in the village of Mahawanya. Their way of life revolved almost entirely around bushcraft, knowing their surroundings intimately, using the river, hunting in the jungle and a certain amount of farming. In the decade since then, I noticed that even the Iquana, whose knowledge of bushcraft is still strong, were more reliant on the radio, the airstrip, and the outboard motor than the Sanamar had been. The Aquana also seemed more aware of the world beyond their borders, which can often be the beginning of the end for bushcraft and their cultural identity. With the Sanamar, I went into the jungle to see how they gather one of the basic jungle foods. 
This may look like a lot of effort, but it's the detailed knowledge of what to look for that makes it worthwhile. By selecting the right tree, they only needed to take one down, and the reward was a huge chunk of fresh food and a great source of carbohydrates. This is what all that work's all been about. This is the heart of palm, and it's one of the best of the tropical survival foods. Very reliable. I can taste a bit of that. Really crisp. Delicious. People say it's like a wild cabbage, but I don't think it tastes like that. It tastes like nothing else that I know. But it's quite delicious. Wonderful. I'm gonna pinch a bit more. But even in today's increasingly motorised world, the jungle still holds hidden secrets. Places like this, where traders would have cooled off from the heat of the day. travel through the jungle, I only ever carry two sets of clothes. One dry for the evening, the other, well it really doesn't matter what happens to your day clothes. They get wet from sweat anyway. It's immensely liberating to live with such limited options and it really gives you freedom to enjoy places like this to their full. The first job to do at every campsite is to clear the ground where you intend to pitch your hammock. It might look quite destructive all the clearing, but actually it's a very small area. In a forest like this, things grow back incredibly fast. The key thing is, I'm temporarily removing habitat, so there's anything that can bite or sting is cleared away. Already I can see in some of the dead wood here, it's already become home to the ever-present termites. I don't want those invading my home in the night. If you spend any length of time in a camp like this, you'll realize that very soon, a few days down the road, the things start to move back in and take over again. So uh, it's only a very temporary presence here. One of the things I love about traveling through jungles is the way any patch of rainforest is transformed into home by the simple act of putting up your hammock. It's strange, but in a place of such scale, your world is actually reduced to little more than a postage stamp. I'm really lucky today because it's dry. Jungle fire lighting can be very difficult, particularly when it's raining hard. First thing you have to do is arrange some sort of cover in wet weather, probably using your tarp or some big leaves. But then there are a couple of other useful tips, and the first is to feather wood like the locals do. What they do is they look for wood that is dry and standing. 
they know that a big piece of wood is going to be dry in its middle and they look particularly for wood that is white. What you do, support the stick on your shoulder like so and then using two hands on the machete push down. And when you've got a good number of feathers curled off the stick you can then just chop them off and there's your kindling to begin with. But even that isn't sometimes enough and there's something that I've grown used to doing in rainforest which is a very useful tip. This is my sharpening kit. In here I've got the stone that I use to sharpen my parang. But I also carry a small lighter and some rubber inner tube or rubber tyre, either will do. And this is a real bomb proof way of making fire because it doesn't matter how wet this gets, it will still light. What I do is I cut that into a small strip. It goes a long way. Like so. When I light that up, away it goes. Wherever I go, there really is no substitute for a fire at the end of the day. It keeps the bugs away and it connects deeply with something within us. The next day the forest began to peter out and the jungle stretched into the savanna as I reached a valley of massive, distinctive mountains known as Tepui. It's the Pomon word for mountain, but a Tepui is far more intriguing than that. It's a place of incredible beauty and deep mysticism. Many Tepui have this characteristic flat top. To Pomon, this makes them places for their gods to live, their version of the Greek Mount Olympus. Another common myth among many of the people of this area is that the Tepui are the remains of the Tree of Life, the base of the trunk which was left when it fell, creating the jungle with its leaves and the rivers with its branches. Staring at them, I could understand how these myths grew up. Tepui are made of some of the oldest rocks on Earth, billions of years old. In fact, they're so old that there are no fossils to be found in them. They come from a time before life was evident on Earth. Some are huge. You could fit a city the size of London on the biggest, and they tower over their surroundings, rising almost two kilometers straight up. They are a mysterious ancient landscape, cut off from the rest of the world, making them a unique habitat. Standing here, it's easy to see how they were the inspiration for Conan Doyle's Lost World. The Lost World is the story of the discovery of living dinosaurs on top of a remote mountain. It was written by Conan Doyle in 1902 and was inspired when he attended a lecture given at the Royal Geographical Society by the first Europeans to climb a Tepui, Everard M. Turn and Harry I. Perkins. Conan Doyle's imagination was sparked by their observations of this strange and remote prehistoric world. And it was no surprise that he populated this lost world with dinosaurs. In the Victorian era, it was a fashion of dinosaurs. So places so isolated, you were trying to find living dinosaurs. And the real fact is that they are still living there. The plants that you can find there, they are evolving from the Cretaceous. So to Conan Doyle or to Imthern, 
it would be very easy to find or to discover some kind of dinosaur. And still, there are people who swear that they have seen dinosaurs. I don't know what they smoke, but actually, dinosaurs for me are the, the things that I see on the correct size, not huge. But in the Tapuis, in some places, you can be like God, because you create. You, you are the first person in one of these mountains, and many of these places and mountains are absolutely unexplored still. And when you are on top of the mountain, you say, let it be this Drosera. And this little carnivorous plant is a new species. And no one ever have ever seen that plant. And you give it to the world. There you are. And you send to some specialist and say, name this. So you are creating things that never existed. Forms, shapes, leaves, colors that no one has described before. So you feel that incredible power of making things appear. If you don't look them, they disappear forever. If you look at them, you create them. This is the experience and the feeling I have on top of a tepui. One of these tepui is home to the highest waterfall on Earth. Angel Falls, almost a kilometre high. The falls got their name from a pilot and adventurer in the 1930s called Jimmy Angel. Like many before him, he was certain that he'd spotted gold on top of a tepui from his plane. His only problem was how to get at the gold. It's not easy to land on a tepui. After checking for a suitable way down, he decided it was worth the risk. But just as he feared, he crashed and had to walk out. To make matters worse, he hadn't found any gold. But he had discovered the falls, hence the name Angel Falls. He and they became so famous that his plane was lifted from the top of the Tepui by helicopter and now stands outside the airport of the city of Ciudad Bolivar. By now I was well into my journey, enjoying the routine and savouring the feeling of being out on the trail. The patches of forest at this junction between jungle and savanna were getting smaller and smaller, and each time I stepped out into the open, I really appreciated the vistas and the liberated feeling of having a horizon once more. But however well defined your path, it's always good to verify your position with the GPS or Global Positioning System. So navigation becomes far more manageable, even in areas like this, where mapping is still in its infancy. A satellite phone is another essential piece of equipment for wilderness expeditions. Whether you're using it for helicopter logistics support or a medical emergency, it can make a real and telling difference to the success of your trip. So what time are you, or is the helicopter due? Yep, that's perfect. And they're bringing extra fuel. Yep, that's great. Brilliant, yep. Catch you tomorrow, take care. Bye. In this age of GPS, satellite phones and air travel, it's sometimes hard to imagine the hardships and timescales of some of the earliest visitors to this region. Perhaps the most moving illustration of this is the tale of Isabella Godin and her husband, who were separated at opposite ends of the Amazon during the early 18th century. She was a native of Peru, who met her French husband, Jean, in the headwaters of the Amazon where she lived. He was taking part in an attempt to measure the circumference of the earth. By the time the job was over, they had had two children and were expecting a third. So Isabella stayed put while Jean set off to arrange passage home to France. 
he wouldn't see his wife again for 20 years. Isabella had to endure heartbreak and uncertainty as her children died of disease and she waited anxiously for news of her husband. For over a decade, Jean struggled to find a way back to his wife and family. I can scarcely imagine how she must have felt when over 10 years after Jean had left, Isabella heard rumours that a boat had finally been sent upriver to collect her. Were the rumours true? And if so, in which of the many rivers that formed the headwaters of the Amazon was it waiting? Even today, mapping of the Amazon is sketchy at best. But in the 1760s, she wouldn't have had a clue where she was. Nonetheless, Isabella wasn't going to let her chance pass. And so she set out on the arduous journey with a small group of family and friends. Any journey through jungle is difficult, but travelling to an uncertain destination without even knowing whether your husband was alive must have been terrible. Incredibly, she did meet up with the boat, but her troubles were far from over. Arriving at a village destroyed by smallpox, her crew deserted, but she had made it this far and wasn't about to turn back. Remember, it's now 16 years since she last saw her husband and she'd lost three children. She cobbled together a crew from the last survivors of the village and the remains of her own party and set off downriver in an old battered canoe. River travel is always hazardous. There are submerged logs, rocks and treacherous currents and they were hardly the best crew. Progress was difficult to say the least and her supplies would have been running low. At times, she must have wondered why she had ever set out on such an epic journey. It was like a bad dream you can't wake up from, but this was one determined lady. With progress slowing, Isabella welcomed the offer by three volunteers to race for help. But maybe she should have questioned their motives when they insisted on taking her jewellery. They never returned. As her party died one by one, Isabella was left with no choice but to try and walk out of the forest on her own. No one knows how far she walked. She would have been delirious with hunger. But what we do know is that somehow she made it. 20 years after they parted, she was finally reunited with her husband, Jean. As I neared my destination, I was coming across more signs of the village up ahead. The Pomon often burn an area of savannah to encourage new growth. The young shoots attract animals that make hunting easier. One more night in a patch of jungle before we made it to the village, and by now the crew were so used to putting up their hammocks, they had started to personalise them. But even when you're near the end of your journey, it's important to keep to established routines like washing and take every opportunity to replenish your water supplies. The jungle may be beautiful, but the humidity can sap your strength and leave you seriously dehydrated. My hammock is a wonderful thing. It's a sanctuary. It's just great. There is no better moment in the day than that moment when you put your hammock up and you lie in it and you take the weight off of your jungle boots for the first time in the day. It is a sheer heavenly moment. Shortly after daybreak, we arrived at the Pomon village of Unec, perched at the border of jungle and savannah, and one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. It's a timeless setting, but only a few hours from the nearest town by boat or by foot, so the Pomon people live a life that is heavily influenced by the modern world. 
There's no running water. The washing and drinking water all comes from the river. But they are so close to the modern world, they have a village video camera. So we gave some tapes to Ricardo, the teacher in the village, to make a video for us of their routine. We have a duty to maintain the indigenous traditions which have been disappearing for some years. So thank you very much for this opportunity. This is a typical drink of the Pemon people of the Grand Savannah. It's called Kachiri. <laughs> Throughout the village there were clear signs of how their bushcraft is being lost bit by bit. The process starts with the availability of a useful tool then before long you rely on it and need to produce more food to pay for everything from buckets to clothes. Along the way the traditional skills get left with the elders until one day they're left behind completely. This is farinha, a flour that adds flavour to the meal. Qatar is nice and spicy food. There are villages like this all over the world, so close to modern amenities, the traditions are being replaced one by one. Yunek is a beautiful place, and the people who live here work so well together that maybe they can keep what is best from their own past and absorb only the good from the outside world. As we filmed with them, there was a great spirit in the village, and I really hope they manage to keep what's special about their way of life because this is an incredible place. And for me, it's the many and varied cultures and ways of life all over our world that make it such a fabulous world. A very good sign is that they continue to build using traditional methods for their housing. Their homes perfectly illustrate the place the Pomon occupy at the boundary of jungle and savanna. The roof and structure are made from wood and palm leaves cut from the jungle. The walls are finished with earth from the savanna. It's one of the places the Pomon bushcraft endures. The palm leaves mustn't be cut during a full moon as the moon's gravitational influence means the leaves are holding more water and this will make them rot sooner. Cutting them needs skill with the single most valuable bushcraft tool, the machete. It's an essential part of bushcraft, so here are a few simple tips on how to use one. With the machete, it's in its sheath until you need it. After all, it's indiscriminate. It'll bite you as much as it'll bite wood. <clears throat> Before you use it, I want to take this uh, tree down here. I've got a use for that. Before I do, I need to make sure I've got clear swipes with the, with the machete. So any vegetation that's in the way, we just clear out of the way like that. Making sure we stay well behind the knife. One of the things that's unique about using machetes or parangs is the speed with which the cuts are made. So 
this is what I'm after. It only, only takes a few cuts to go through. It's perfect to show some of the ways of cutting with a machete. Now I clean it up. It's got a vine around it here as it comes down. At a full arm's reach, just trim everything off. Once I get down to where the branch is no longer thick enough for my intended purpose, then I'll truncate it. And I'll do that with just one slash at about 30 degrees. You can see that in this environment, a sharp harangue and the right technique means you can collect whatever you need very quickly. It's also worth bearing in mind that it's very hard to work in this environment. It's very humid, you sweat profusely, it's very tiring. So good technique and a sharp harangue makes life easier. Every cut we make with this tool has to be planned. We have to know what we're doing. And we need, wherever possible, to cut with the grain to our advantage. So don't, we don't cut at 90 degrees to the grain, but at an angle to it. A good example of that is how we make a point on a stick. Let's imagine I want to make a stake here with a point on the end. I could cut it through and then sharpen it like a pencil, but I don't need to with this tool. What I do is I'm going to cut about that angle there. I'm obviously completely behind the tool, and there's a good bit of wrist action in this cut like so. One, and I turn the stick, two, three, and we're almost through, four. There we go. So we cut it through and end up with a point all in one go. I can further trim that and tidy it in the same manner with a confident action. But you see I've moved my hand further up the parang to give a little bit more fine control like so. If I want to flatten the top, then I'd normally lie down onto a branch or a root like this, and good, firm blows. You can see it's a very sharp tool. And it has to be used with great accuracy. A machete is as versatile as the person using it. With practice, no job is too strenuous. A good machete is a real bushcraft friend. The villagers of Unec work as a unit. They farm and are even trying to coax the barren savannah earth to bear fruit. One of their staples has always been cotton. So it was great to meet one of the village elders who told us how she learned the traditional way to spin it. My mother taught me when I was nine years old, but it's taken all this time to become an expert. There aren't that many girls now that know how to spin, because times have changed. Years ago, we didn't have schools, and so people spent more time in their homes, which is when my mother taught me all these things. It was also useful for us to know how to make our own hammocks. I don't speak any Pomon, but I could have listened to her all day. 
What a fantastic lady. We may not speak Pomon, but there is one universal language that's understood everywhere. Football is not my thing, but for the crew it was an opportunity to join in that they couldn't resist. Mind you, it did seem to become the geriatrics taking on a youth team. And I'm not sure that's in the rule book. The children of the village spend every spare minute on this pitch, and who can blame them? It's a perfect setting. Pomon have a rich cultural history of their own. There were rock paintings nearby, and as the end of my time here approached, I took the chance to go and take a look. I'm fascinated by rock art and ancient symbols. These haven't been studied yet in any great detail, but they remind me of similar paintings made in red ochre in Australia on the other side of the world. The Pomon have only been here a few centuries, so these paintings may not be the most ancient I've ever seen. They would still have been done before the Pomon had any contact with the outside world, and ancient superstitions still surround them. What stories do you remember associated with this place? Ah, sí. Bueno, el profesor era bueno uno de de muchachos. Years ago, there was a scientist who had heard about the pictograms but didn't believe what he'd heard. So one day he decided to come over and check if they were really here, and he saw it was true, and there were some pictures. So he studied the pictures and copied them and spent several hours here. Then he returned to his village. But when he tried to go to bed, he couldn't sleep. No one knows exactly what happened, but he had real problems in the night. Strange nightmares and feelings. And all because of these pictograms. It may sound far-fetched to our modern world, but I could understand what he meant. It's difficult to describe what it feels like to be here. I think the nearest thing I could say is rather like walking into a public library when there's nobody else there. There's an energy left by the people. There are signs when you learn to recognise them, like the ground that's been scorched by fire, that says many people have sat here, trod here, been here. You can almost hear echoes of the conversations coming from the walls themselves. Places like this are very special. I'm very lucky because I've been able to travel to many parts of the world where traditional people have told me of places like this and explained what happens in them. One thing you can say for certain is that when you get rock art, you've, you've come to a place where people spend a lot of time. And just having a look around here, I found this area here where the sand is very grey. And sand changes to this grey colour, like that, when you have a lot of fires here. In fact, there's still signs of the occasional fire, some, some charcoal here. 
and then poking around in it I've already found interesting things. I've got some stone here that shows evidence of being worked by people. There's a little blade there that's been struck off of a core by somebody. Probably very old, the edges are quite rounded. There are bits of quartz also that show signs of being worked by people. But there isn't any quartz to be found near here. So this has been brought here specifically, probably because the quartz gave a very sharp cutting edge. This is a tiny blade made of jasper, but this jasper is not from near here. Again, it's been brought here and worked. You can see there the distinctive ridges, conchoidal fracture marks that show that this has been made by a person. It's been struck from a core in this way, bang, off it comes, giving this tiny little razor blade. And there's even ochre, there's yellow and there's red ochre. These may be rocks that were some of the, provided some of the pigments that made these very paintings. Fantastic. The power of the paintings reminded me how bushcraft often reinforces the power of places to inspire us and I had an irresistible urge for one last bit of exploration. It's been a fantastic visit, but if there's one place to take a last look at this stunning landscape, it's got to be up there on top of that pinnacle. incredible view, I'm not even on the top yet, and the landscape, it just stretches on as far as the eye can see. And already the forest has taken on that look of broccoli, but I can still hear the sounds inside it. But that is another world, this is a separate place, and I really think that Conan Doyle was close to the mark when he said this was a lost world. Maybe not lost, just not yet discovered.